the early Slavs in warfare. The written evidence suggests that life in the early Middle Ages was frequently marked by episodes of violence throughout Europe, and it seems that warfare of one sort or another was endemic in almost all early medieval societies. The written sources contain quite a bit of information about ancient warfare. Most textbooks contain information about Slavic attacks on Byzantium in the area bordering the Danube and in the Balkans. Often, however, these records do not mention intergroup skirmishes, which were very common in the early days. From Byzantine sources we learn of fighting between tribes, such as between the Sclavines and Antis on the Danube, the presence of fortresses in northern Slavdom from the 7th century onward, and the general improvement in the effectiveness of weapons of the period seem to indicate similar rivalries between groups. At a time when social organization was relatively poorly developed, the scope and range of warfare were limited. During most of the period considered in this video, the most that many Slav groups could attain were small-scale raids. Since most of the tribal groupings considered here were relatively small, until the rise of first Slavic states the number of invaders was limited. A typical Slavic barbarian warrior band of the early medieval period may have contained only 200 warriors. Since smaller armies cannot carry much excess baggage in the form of supplies, the invaders could usually feed only on game they could hunt in foreign territory. Invading enemy territory would be limited not only in distance, but also in time. The invading force could not afford to stay too long in an enemy territory, as this might give the locals time to build up larger forces against them. Motives for war may vary. Raids may be intended to acquire loot to be shared out among followers of a particular leader, to avenge a wrong, to subdue a neighboring leader, or they may be conducted so that the unexperienced young men prove themselves and win their way into the ranks of warriors. Warriors might go off in relatively small groups on raids for a few days to prove their manhood and to gain booty. The motivation for many of these actions would have been prestige, which, measured in non-material terms, has always been an important factor in social structure in many societies. Battle honor and material generosity were common status enhancements, and warfare was perhaps a somewhat dangerous community prestige game rather than a fight to the annihilation. In primitive warfare, the function of leadership is rather weak. Social pressure from the community and loss of personal prestige are the only pressures on the warrior to fight. He fights for himself or to protect his family and village. If however a leader can link warriors to him personally by an oath, and if he reinforces these links by honoring that group with wealth and prestige, warriors will fight first and foremost for him. The equipment and tactics of the Danubian Slavs are mentioned in a number of Byzantine written sources. Procopius, as well as various military commanders have reported about them. From Chilbutius, one of the best military commanders of his time who in 530, as a result of massive invasions of the Antis, Bulgarians, and Sclavines became a commander of the defense in Thrace, we learn that the Slavs fight on foot, advancing on the enemy. In their hands they carry small shields and spears, but they never wear armor. Some of them do not have neither a tunic nor a cloak, but wear only a kind of breeches. Although this paragraph says the Sclavines and Antis east north of the Danube fought on foot. Elsewhere Procopius uses wording which suggests that his description might refer to horse-borne warriors. While we have a considerable number of spearheads, we have little archaeological evidence of the shields mentioned by Procopius, which were probably circular wooden constructions covered with leather without a metal umbo. There is no evidence of the Slavs using helmets until quite a late period. The sword is rarely mentioned in Byzantine sources and it would seem was used mainly by the elite. Other written sources describe the equipment of Sclavine raiders, thus we have a mention of their use of the bow, sling, and axes. John of Ephesus informs us that the Slavs and Avars learned how to use siege machines from the Byzantine army. The use of wolf pit traps around their settlements mentioned in some Byzantine written sources should perhaps also be counted as the influence of Byzantine tactics. In Morris's Strategikon, a manual of war that was to serve as a general guide or handbook to Byzantine art of war, we read about descriptions how best to attack the Slavs in their Danubian homelands. 
From various literary sources referring to the early Slavs, we are told that in their homelands north of the Danube they lived in forests, by rivers, swamps, and wetlands difficult of access. Because of the frequent dangers threatening them, they built several entrances to their settlements. Nothing, however, is said about the construction of strongholds by the Slavs. We are told that they hide away their produce, leaving nothing in a visible place. According to the Byzantine writer, they lead a piratical way of life, attacking their enemies in four forested terrain, or in confined or steep places. They usually use ambushes, sudden attacks, and tricks, either in the day or night. They tended not to fight in an organized fashion, nor did they like to fight in the open. Later it is mentioned how they lay in wait for a retreating invader to attack in ambush in the forest to retrieve the loot, and also how the Slavs lay ambushes around fortified camps and drew soldiers away from the defenses and attacked them from the flanks. The dense settlement structure in river valleys allowed easy communication of an attack, and the inhabitants of settlements further away were able to prepare ambushes for the invading army. The the writer also has something to say of Slav arms. They are armed with short spears. Each man carries two, some of them with a large shield, though one difficult to use. They also use wooden bows and small poisoned arrows. We are also told that there were infantry and cavalry. In the section on how to organize attacks on the Slavs, leaders are advised not to take wagons or too much heavy equipment with them, as it will slow them down in the terrain where the Slavs are likely to attack. These sources of course reflect the specific situation in the Danubian region and we are not able to know whether these references may be applied to the evidence from other areas of Slavdom. The Slav invaders of the East Roman and Byzantine Empire in the 6th and 7th centuries formed relatively well-organized armies of some considerable size under a stronger leadership, creating a substantial threat to the northern provinces of the weakened empire. In part, the degree of organization of the Slavs was a response to the nature of the forces they were up against. Procopius mentions attacks by a throng of Slavs and sometimes gives estimates who led these huge war bands on their raids. We have seen above that the need to compete with outsiders is one factor which can lead to the formation of pan-tribal warrior associations which can in some cases lead to the creation of an ethnic identity around this group of fighting men. The case of the rise of the new tribes of North American Plains Indians has been cited as a recent example of this. It would seem very likely that the rise of the large organized forces of Slavs which the East Roman and Byzantine writers tell us crossed the lines would be best explained by a similar mechanism. It would seem that the creation of this fighting force in opposition to the Roman world was the main factor in the growth of an ethnic identification of the Slavs on the Danube. With the centralization of power in chiefdoms and states and the increase in the size of polities, we see the increase in size of organized warrior bands which could be mobilized. This allowed the conducting of warfare for the purpose of conquest of new territory and holding it, which had the effect of supplying revenue for the tribute economy. The ability to organize force on this scale was the principal requirement for state formation. One problem which remains to be completely resolved is the degree to which the horse was used by early Slav warriors. Theophylactus Simicats tells us that in the Danubian region the elite and their retainers were often mounted. Most invading warrior bands would of course have also been accompanied by draft animals to carry supplies and the resultant loot, and Theophylactus describes the Slavs as making a circle of their wagons during a battle. One may suspect that the speed of movement of the Slav hordes invading the East Roman Empire may have been due to the use of horses. Indeed, Procopius uses for the Slav attacks of 548 a term stratuma which he elsewhere employs for troops on horseback. The account of John of Ephesus writing of events in 581 to 584 tells us specifically that the Slavs busied themselves robbing herds of horses and much weaponry, and they have learned to conduct war better than the Romans. Indeed, Horsemen 536 to 537 Procopius tells us that there were Slav and Hun horsemen as mercenaries in the imperial army. By the end of the 6th century, therefore, the horse seems to have been in relatively wide use among the Slavs. The Philactus Simicat tells us about how in the course of a raid the Slavs dismounted from their horses in order to cool themselves and give their mounts a rest. 
There is a little archaeological evidence in the form of bridal parts from a few Romanian sites, in general though remains of horses kept in herds in the fields and pastures outside the settlement would not be expected to occur in settlement debris. One is reminded of the story of Oleg's horse which died. The prince had to ride out to look at its remains which had been left to fall apart on the surface. The Avar raids on East Roman and Byzantine territory in which the Slavs took part were presumably carried out from horseback. The Avar seemed to have later brought the steer up to Europe. This was an important clement of the harness, for it enabled the horseman to sit more firmly in his scat and allowed a spear to be used as a lance. It is possible that this pattern was adopted by the Slavs in the 7th century, for the hooked spurs which appear over Central Europe may be linked with the use of heavy cavalry in a charge. The horse was also probably important to the armies of the Bulgars penetrating the Danubian frontier from the steppe. The horse was in use among the Slavs at a later period too. Constantine Porphyrogenus was probably exaggerating when he informs us of the 60,000 horsemen of the Croatian King Tomislav, but this gives an indication of the probable importance of cavalry in the Slav warfare of the period. In the pre-state period these were steppe horses, but the bone evidence from Poland suggests that large strong war horses were being bred there on princely and nobles estates probably by the end of the 10th century. We are informed by Ibrahim ibn Yaqub staying in Prague in 965 to 966 that in the kingdom of Misko to the north the prince's retinue was a horse-born troop, and that Prague was notable for the production of saddles, bridles, and the flimsy shields which are used in those countries. It may be that the ramparts of strongholds were developed as much against cavalry charges as for any other reason. With the formation of regular armies by the developed chiefdoms and early states, the power and scope of warfare increased markedly. The most common disputes will have been of a political nature, though raids seeking loot or to disable a potential enemy may have been carried out too. The main aim of the attacks will now be to subordinate the attacked communities to the will of the leader of the army, that is, the invading state, and to extend the area of territory under permanent and direct control of a leader intending to extend his power. The territorial extent and intensity of the attack is considerably increased in the case of a large and well-organized army. A larger army can carry many of its own supplies. The invaders can be supported by well-organized supply lines and are not reliant for supplies only on what they can obtain on foreign territory. Also, if the attack is carried out for territorial gain, as soon as an area is subdued, a new state apparatus is set up, a primary aim of which will be to keep the supply lines to the front open. The strongholds which appear over most of northern Slavdom from the 7th century are usually seen as structures of primarily military function. It should be noted that undefended settlements are much more common in most areas of Slavdom, and settlements are not always situated in more defensible positions such as hilltops. The strongholds are therefore sites with some kind of specialist function. It is perhaps simplistic to see them exclusively as military sites, but we may examine their possible manner of functioning as such. An obvious function of strongholds is as refuge strongholds. The archaeological evidence for these sites is that they are large defended areas from which there is little evidence of permanent buildings. They are thus interpreted as fortified areas built to protect a community which would gather there to shelter in time of external threat, presumably together with their livestock. Another function is as a military base. We have few references to the forces from these sites sallying out to meet the enemy in the field, but there are a number of accounts of sieges. The success of an invader's attack would depend not only on its military strength, but also on its ability to move faster than the messengers and warriors of the attacked community before they could raise a force to counterattack. The potential military role of strongholds in this scenario in theory is clear. They would have contained and protected a military force whose function was either to destroy an invading force or to keep the invader occupied while reinforcements could come from other areas. The invader would have to destroy the stronghold and its contained force in order to advance further, otherwise the stronghold would act as a focus for forces which would be ready to pursue or ambush the invader on the way home. Many of the earliest strongholds have relatively weak defenses, and we may imagine that in the early part of the early medieval period they were not a major feature in the tactics of warfare. Their ramparts may have defended against sudden raids by relatively weak forces. On the whole, however, the defenses seem to have the value of demarcating an elite settlement from the outside world and endowing it with prestige.
One may also infer that they were not meant to withstand a siege, but that any fighting was done outside the stronghold. By the 8th and particularly the 9th centuries in the northern parts of Slavdom, a number of rather better defended strongholds were being constructed, and it is with these sites that one can see that they were beginning to be used in a tactical sense. Some of them seem to form networks of territorial defense. Some consist of several conjoined enclosures. The inner one was the stronghold proper, while the outlying ones were probably for the horses of the fighting force and used to protect the local people in times of threat. The defense of a stronghold has two main aspects. The first is resisting the invader, and the second is physically surviving a siege. Probably with the appearance of larger armies, strongholds could have been besieged for relatively long periods. There would have been hand-to-hand -hand fighting if scaling ladders were used, or if the wall was to be breached, and surprise sallies on the enemy camped outside the wall, or to attack small groups who succeeded in getting close to the wall. Ideally, inside the stronghold will have been everything necessary for surviving the siege. This includes a large quantity of food, a source of fresh water and materials for repairs to structures and equipment. It would obviously be of advantage to site open settlements near to strongholds in order to have the opportunity to make use of its protection should the need arise. Very often we find one or more open settlements directly outside the ramparts of a stronghold, often mainly agricultural, but also the focus for craft production servicing the inhabitants of the stronghold. The proximity of such a settlement was additionally advantageous for those inside the stronghold who on hearing of an impending attack would be able to rapidly gather additional supplies from the adjacent settlement. Those settlements closer to the stronghold could however expect to suffer at the hands of besieging forces. We have seen that early Slav settlements tend to form clusters, and we find that the areas between settlement complexes often have the form of empty buffer zones of virgin forest. This may suggest some form of inter-group hostility. There is some evidence that these empty zones were deliberately left free of settlement not only to form clear boundary zones, but primarily to make their penetration difficult. Since there was little hope of gaining supplies from communities met on the way, the conducting of raids across such territories by an enemy would require the consumption of substantial supplies. Another feature which seems to have appeared at about the same time is linear earthworks. These early medieval ramparts, from a few hundred meters to a few kilometers in length, tend now to be poorly preserved and difficult to trace and seem to have run between natural obstacles such as forest and marsh. There are three main groups. In Ukraine, just to the south of Kiev, the so-called Zimivy Volley, Dragon Walls, defending that town against attack from the south. The Silesian ramparts were probably constructed in the 8th or 9th century to block movements from the west. A similar defense is seen in Kujavia between the Warda and Vistula rivers, again probably built between the 9th and 11th century to prevent Pomeranian incursions in the south. To the west there is a whole series of similar ramparts in Saxony and Thuringia. With the increase of warfare waged for territorial gain, mechanisms had to be developed to maintain control over the newly acquired lands. This process was most effective in situations where there had already been some form of centralized control. A simple coup d'etat, a switching of leaders, was all that was required. A people already paying tribute to a central power would, in the interest of leading a peaceful life, presumably be relatively easily persuaded to follow a new leader. Two options were open to the victorious invader. The old tribal aristocracy could be retained and subjugated to the needs of a new master by a variety of more subtle or brutal methods. The other option was to destroy them utterly and take over the leaderless people using loyal men appointed as overseers. According to various sources, Rurik reputedly settled his men in the strongholds of northern Russia as did his kinsman Oleg. It would seem that the first option was chosen. The local leaders retained their positions and directed tributes and allegiance to the new ruler. We later read that in 914 Igor extorted a higher tribute from the native Derevlane nobility which had been subjugated three decades earlier. In 945, however, in another attempt to raise the tribute, Igor was captured and killed. 
He was buried outside the chief stronghold of the Derevlane at Iskorostan. It was clear that Prince Mel of the Derevlane was aspiring for the Kievan throne. He wished to replace the Kievan line with his own native dynasty. The sighting of Igor's grave outside his personal stronghold was presumably intended to legitimate his taking of power by conquest. Olga took terrible revenge for the treachery of the Derevlane, her husband's death, and the attempt to create a new ruling dynasty. She besieged and then burnt the stronghold at Iskorostan and captured the Derevlane elite. The rest of the inhabitants of the stronghold were either killed or given as slaves to her men. We are not told what happened to Mel. To judge by what had happened to his emissaries, his fate would not have been a pleasant one. After that, Olga went through the land of the Derevlane, establishing a new tribute. In Bohemia and Wielkoposka, it seems from the archaeological evidence that a different option was chosen. The rise of the first states in these areas is represented in the archaeological record by the demolition of the tribal strongholds and their replacement on the same site or nearby with totally new constructions. This presents a picture of a more brutal manner of operation. It seems that the tribal power was totally obliterated and replaced by new men, and no attempt whatsoever was made to pretend a continuity of power. Power. The fate of prisoners of war was either to become slaves or to be resettled far from home. Slaves were a valuable and mobile source of revenue for the victorious army. Byzantine written sources tell us that prisoners captured by Slav invaders of the Balkans were treated in several or different ways. Pseudo Morris in Strategic and states that the Slavs are a hospitable people and do not keep prisoners indefinitely, but lay down a certain period after which they can decide for themselves if they want to return to their former homelands after paying a a ransom, or to stay among the Slavs as free men and friends. Procopius in history of the wars hints at a similar process, at least in the case of slaves from other Slav tribes. Elsewhere, however, in the same book Procopius describes an earlier invasion in 549 to 550 of Thracia and Illyria. He states that these Slavs always slew the enemies they met. On capturing Topir, they reputedly murdered 15,000 civilians, men of all ages, and took only the women and children into slavery. Some of the men were shut into their huts with cattle and sheep which were too numerous to take back to the Slav homelands north of the Danube and the houses set on fire. In 550, however, the Slavs for the first time took large numbers of prisoners and drove them north of the Danube. In 551, they repeated the action in Illyria, killing and destroying everything that they could not take and taking prisoners. The taking only of women and children seems to have been dictated by the difficulties of preventing possible escape and rebellion by male prisoners. Children would be particularly defenseless removed from their homes and would be reliant on their captors for survival. Growing up in a barbarian environment, they would be prone to assimilation in their foster communities. Women with children in their care would be less likely to escape or fight their captors. They could not only work for but also be sexually exploited by their male captors. In a later period, there is considerable evidence for the large-scale forcible resettlement of defeated populations. This process seems likely to have began with the rise of the state, but was particularly prevalent in the Kievan state in the 11th and 12th centuries. The resettlement of entire populations had four main functions. One, to break down old social ties based on kinship and territorial bonds, thus preventing effective opposition to new social conditions. Two, to settle potentially rich but underdeveloped lands in one's own territory to increase revenue. The use of enforced settlement from outside was a way of rapid rapidly increasing production. Recent archaeological evidence from Wielkopolska shows this process in operation in the 10th century. 3. The controlled depopulation of areas and selected areas of a new state. This could have, for example, a significance in the organization of defense, creating wide zones of unpopulated no-man's lands between one's own territory and neighbors. 4. The settling by new populations which were loyal to a new leader of conquered areas which had previously been weakened by ethnic deportation. The colonization of the northern lands of Kievan Rus by groups drawn from the south, such as Valinians, was a means not only of weakening resistance in troublesome areas, but also of creating new ethnic identities in the resettled areas. The substrate of what is now Belarusia was originally Balt or Balto-Slav, but resettlement by the 10th century created ethnic mixing and reformation. Although the Balt hydronyms remain, the area is now ethnically Slavic. 
Recently, evidence from ceramics at Sandomirs in Poland has been interpreted as a possible trace of the penetration of this area by populations from Wielkopolska when Malopolska was joined to the Polish state 